Hello, and for the last time in a while, welcome to Frontington Station, where today I'll be taking everything apart. In order to make way for my new layout, this old layout needs to be completely dismantled. But before I do that, I wanted to take the time to appreciate it for what it is, to run all my locos, to reminisce about all the adventures. So I'm starting this video with a bit of a gala running session. My journey into model railways started when I was a kid with this very Hornby Intercity 125. I'm amazed it still runs, given that it's about 30 years old and has probably never had a service. And it does look ridiculous on this layout. It's not an era I'm looking to model, but this is definitely a keeper, just for sentimental reasons. This is my only other diesel, a Lima Class 117 three-car DMU in green. It's got an old Ringfield motor, which is a little noisy, and it needs some replacement traction tyres, but otherwise it's in pretty good nick. Another old favourite is this Replica Railways 5700 class pannier tank in GWR Green. This was my favourite model growing up. In recent years it's not seen a lot of action, mainly because the split chassis mechanism is really dated by modern standards. It's received a few cosmetic upgrades, but internally it's, it's now had the motor removed so that it can freewheel for double heading purposes. In fact here it's actually being pushed. Another loco from my childhood, this started life as a Hornby Smoky Joe. In recent years I've given it a rough repaint, some light weathering, a set of handrails along the tanks, and picked out some cab details. But the most obvious change is the addition of a shunter's wagon, which not only acts as a tender so it can carry more coal, but more importantly provides an extra couple of sets of pickups, which makes it a much more reliable runner. I've got a bit of a soft spot for this one. This is a Replica Railways model of a Thompson B1 in BR Black. I don't think I've ever shown this loco on my layout, and that's partly because I've always considered it too big for this layout, and partly because the wheel centres have popped out so it doesn't run. It needs a new wheel set really. But visually, it's still in very good condition, considering its age. Staying with the black kettle theme, here are two locos I bought specifically for this layout, just before I started down the GWR theme. The larger one is a Hornby J94, which, despite its small size, is a really powerful little locomotive. And the smaller one is a Hornby Terrier, which looks very cute. Both have received very minor visual enhancements to pick out some details. And finally we have two more Great Western locomotives, starting with this Backman 4500 class Small Prairie. This is my absolute favourite of the bunch. I just love the wheel arrangement, the balanced stance, and the smart looks. I've also got this Backman 5600 class Taffy Tank, which has already been converted to DCC in readiness for the new layout. Well now it's finally time to pack all the locos and rolling stock away. Some of these I'm sure will make an appearance on the new layout, others may be kept just for sentimental reasons. The scenery on this layout tells its own story. This footbridge is a lovely foreground feature and was cobbled together from bits of an old green Hornby footbridge. 
I've got another video on that if you're interested. The Booking Hall was another fun project, transforming an HO scale model of Tinmouth Station into a double O scale building with a custom interior and Great Western paint job. The platform itself is made from repainted Hornby units. The platform lamps are a bit oversized really, but painted in GWR colours they look passable. building behind the platform was originally a Hornby goods shed. I didn't like the original texture, so I printed my own onto card and stuck it over the top. On this layout it's been serving as a museum, although I never got round to making the interior. On a similar theme, this is a Hornby engine shed, similarly covered with brick paper to hide its original form. The floor here is made from thick cardboard and was meant to represent concrete. As free solutions go, it wasn't a bad effort. This signal box is a little battered in places, showing its age. I've got another signal box at Backwards, which is a custom designed card model. Neither of them ended up with interiors. Backwards was always meant to represent a smaller, less impressive station. Again, it started life as some Hornby platform sections, with that end curve made from some offcuts of polystyrene and all covered in card. Moving on to the residential area, these two houses were ratio kits that I put together a few years ago. The interior is divided into rooms so that the lighting is a bit more interesting, but there's no furniture. The bungalow was from my childhood layout, I have no idea of its origins. And the row of houses at the end are made from cardboard, not terribly precisely, but they do the job. With all the buildings removed, we're left with just the scenery. The trees are a mixture of homemade items and cheap plastic ones. The field at the back is where I keep my sheep. And this field used some old teddy bear fur to depict a crop of wheat ripe for harvest. And the back scenes came from a panoramic photo which I edited and printed onto A4 paper at home. leaves us with the track itself. It's all old, mostly steel, and all the curves are first radius. The points are controlled by wire rods, again I've got a video about that if you're interested. I've got it set up with cab control via this control panel, allowing me to switch different sections between my two controllers. It's simple but effective, and means I can control two locos independently even though I'm on DC. You can see some of my wiring here too. It's not amazingly tidy, because getting underneath the layout is a bit of a challenge. I was pleasantly surprised how easily the track came up. It was held in place with track pins, but the polystyrene didn't exactly hold it tight, and the ballast was glued down with cheap PVA, so it came loose with just a little gentle prying with a screwdriver. I then washed all the track to get the ballast off, don't want that getting everywhere once I put the track in storage. And there go the back scenes. And underneath it all we have a layer or three of extruded polystyrene sheet to build up the landscape sat on top of 12mm chipboard. Mm -hmm. 
There are a few supporting braces underneath, and it's perched on the cheapest legs IKEA could sell me. And it's all been solid as a rock. No flexing or bending or warping. So much so, in fact, that getting it apart again was an absolute nightmare. The nails held it all together really well, and it took a lot of prying to get the wood apart. And because the supports were attached to the top surface, it actually had little to no structural integrity on its own, so it just collapsed as I took it apart. I'm so glad I won't need to do this again. And that's it. Frontington and Backwards is no more. Some of the materials may be reused, but a lot of it probably won't. It's been a fantastic journey, a wonderful experiment, a valuable learning experience. And huge thanks go out to everyone who's helped me over the years with this layout, sharing advice, teaching me new skills, and giving me helpful and encouraging feedback. But it's the end of this story, and time for the next story to begin. I'm really sad to say goodbye to this layout, but also really excited for what's just around the corner. So do look out for my future videos where I'll continue charting the story of the Rebuild project. You can subscribe to this channel to make sure you don't miss an update, and I'll post smaller updates on Facebook too. If you'd like to contribute financially, I've got a page set up on buymeacoffee.com. But just as valuable to me is your feedback, so leave your comments below. That's all for this video, and for the original Frontington and Backwards Railway. Bye for now.